I'm really excited to um, be introducing these two speakers from the University of Washington, Doug Tischer and David Jurgens, and they're going to be talking about deep learning techniques in this post-structure world. Uh, take it away. Welcome to my channel. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Doug Tischer, and um, I'll be starting the first half of the presentation, and then David will be talking uh, for the second half of the, the presentation. So uh, we're protein engineers, and you know a large part of that is being concerned with making small, well-folded proteins that are thermostable. But uh, of course, proteins in and of themselves are usually only useful if they have some sort of function associated with them. And given the close relationship between structure and function, usually this means incorporating a small functional motif into a larger scaffold. Um, and although you know, an ultimate goal of protein engineering is to be able to make these functional motifs uh, computationally, uh, we're not quite there yet. And in the meantime, uh, nature has provided us with a wealth of already perfectly good functional motifs. And it's our job as protein engineers to be able to uh, scaffold them into new scaffolds. You know, the uh, downside of these native motifs, although they have the function we want, is that they're oftentimes attached to large, unstable, multi-chain proteins, which aren't really suitable for like biotechnology applications or synthetic biology. So as an overview of the workflow that we'll be talking about today, our design process looks something like this. We'll take a structure with a known functional motif, in this case, some native protein binding a target protein in blue. Um, we can look at the structure and identify the structural components that comprise uh, that functional motif, and then use one of the two uh, design methods we'll talk about today, in painting or hallucination, to build a custom scaffold uh, for, for that motif. Now, uh, scaffolding native motifs uh, kind of lends itself to four de design cases in particular, uh, some of which we'll touch on today. Uh, that includes epitope presentation for focused vaccine development, viral receptor traps, active sites and metal binding sites, as well as uh, binding or protein-protein interaction interfaces and enhancing them. So although, uh, you know, we're certainly not the first people to be interested in this idea of transplanting functional motifs from native proteins into new proteins. Um, the existing uh, approaches either rely on finding a suitable uh, native uh, protein scaffold that can accept the functional motif or uh, doing a lot of sampling packing with secondary structure elements, which takes a lot of trial and error. So we are wondering if uh, given the recent advances in deep learning, that might open up a third avenue for uh, solving this problem. And by recent advances, I, I think we're probably all familiar with, you know, the success of AlphaFold 2 in the most recent CASP, as well as the Rosetta Fold network that was developed here in the Baker lab. Both have really exceptional abilities to um, produce high accuracy protein backbones. Uh, structures, as well as uh, side chain confirmations and predicting protein-protein interactions. And so we were really interested in uh, using these networks to help solve this uh, protein design problem. So the two ways that we'll be talking about in this project are, uh, a first method is called hallucination, which you can think of as an iterative refinement process. Basically, you start with a random sequence and you have some desired functional motif that you use to score predicted structure. You use the, the loss to update the um, sequence and you iterate through that several times until you converge on a final design. And then in the second approach, which we call in-painting, is more of a filling of missing information tasks that David will talk about, where we retrain one of these networks to jointly predict sequence and structure given only partial information in the beginning. So I'll start by uh, adding some details about the hallucination method. And the uh, first, first place to start is just a high level uh, understanding of what the Rosetta Fold network does. And at a very high level, what it, it does is it takes in a sequence and predicts a structure. 
we're probably most familiar with the kind of Cartesian coordinate representation of the structure that uh, Rosetta fold and alpha fold produce. Um, but uh, for the purposes of hallucination, there's also a second representation of the protein geometry, which is the pairwise 60 coordinates between all pairs of residues in the backbone. And it's this um, prediction that we use most heavily in uh, the hallucination method. So uh, just getting in a little more specific, this um, you know, pairwise uh, interaction uh, matrix, if you zoom into one of these um, particular like IJ interactions, uh, the information contained there is really all six degrees of freedom. That's one distance, two dihedrals, and three angle distributions. And um, the important thing to, to know about the way the network makes these predictions is that it makes them, uh, it produces a distribution over each of these degrees of freedom rather than predicting a single scalar value. And so in the loss function, we basically score this uh, distribution in two different ways. Um, we, we take the output from the uh, Rosetta Fold network and mask it into two different regions. One region is all of the intergeometric contacts uh, within the motif, and then uh, everything else, uh, all the other residue, residue interactions that occur outside the motif. For the one inside the motif, um, we basically measure the cross entropy between the predicted distribution shown here in purple with the kind of ground truth one hot distribution that we get from the, the ground truth structure. And for all other IJ positions, um, we basically want to encourage the network to make a protein like structure but without necessarily having to hard code the exact uh, structure that it should adopt. So the way we do that is by asking the network to be as certain as it can about the um, protein geometry that it's predicting. And uh, mathematically that turns into uh, asking the network to minimize the entropy of the predicted distribution. So these two components, the recapitulating the motif geometry and making a well-structured protein make up the two primary components of the loss function, uh, which we then use to update the, the sequence. Originally, we did this using a Monte Carlo method and then since transitioned to backpropagating gradients to update the, the sequence. And so kind of uh, the design pipeline would look something like this. Uh, we start with a random sequence and it, there's a corresponding relatively unstructured prediction. And then gradually the, um, the sequence is uh, slowly updated and the structure uh, begins to better meet the, the loss function. So it starts to get more structured and eventually um, has the structural motif that we're, we're interested in. And the last part in our design pipeline is uh, the, the filtering process that we go through. You know, we can't say that this process is good enough where we can like one shot um, uh, engineering proteins yet, but we do make several hundred to several thousand uh, uh, protein uh, designs and then pass them through uh, alpha fold as a quasi orthogonal metric on the uh, sequence structure relationship. So, when we pass our design sequences through alpha fold, we're uh, usually filtering on this confidence metric, the a predicted local difference distance test or PLDT, asking that be greater than 80. And we're asking also that the motif RMSD be less than one angstrom generally. So all of the designs David and I will be showing today have passed these, these filtering metrics. So, with that out of the way, I'll go over three design problems that we've used for uh, hallucination. The first of which is um, scaffolding epitopes to elicit a focused um, immune response. So the idea behind this is that um, antibodies that bind special privileged epitopes in uh, viral receptors are able to um, disable a, a range of viruses. And uh, so, yeah, if we can make an antibody or we can coax the immune system into raising an antibody against the specific motif, it has the capability to be broadly neutralizing. 
the problem is that um, if you were to just inject this one protein into an animal, you can oftentimes get antibodies that are raised against many different epitopes on the surface and so aren't focused against this one privileged epitope. But the immune system does uh, react more strongly to uh, epitopes that it's seen before. So the idea is that if you can come in with a series of proteins that are all structurally different, except that they all retain this common motif, the idea is that in the beginning, you kind of get the expected broad immune response. But then over time, because the only thing that the immune system is repeatedly seeing is this one privileged epitope, that you get uh, an increased um, an increasingly focused uh, immune response over uh, several uh, doses. So the target that we went after in this case is a protein from respiratory syncytial virus, which is responsible for, um, it was a cause of infant mortality early in life. And here you see the um, F protein of the virus bound to a neutralizing antibody in blue down below. And the, the binding site is composed of these two epitopes, site two and site five. Um, site two was previously uh, um, uh, scaffolded into new, uh, new protein scaffolds using more traditional approaches, but uh, site five so far has been recalcitrant to scaffolding. Um, but GUNR group using this hallucination method was able to um, take this site five epitope and uh, graft it in into or make these three different scaffolds that hold the, the epitope in place. And then, um, you know, not only are these designs, they're actually functional uh, as assessed by surface plasmon resonance. You can see for these three designs are right here. Um, this is assaying binding to the neutralizing antibody. And so you can see there's a nice dose dependent relationship between the designs and their ability to bind this neutralizing antibody. Uh, the second design problem that we went after is one of controlling self signaling. And in this case, we were interested in the receptor TRIC A, which is the receptor for nerve growth factor. Um, and signaling through TRIC A is important because it controls the proliferation and differentiation of nerve progenitor cells. And the important thing to know about TRIC A signaling is that normally the nerve growth factor, its native ligand, dimerizes to protein subunits of TRIC A and induces cell signaling. But, uh, you know, for a lot of the times it can be or could be advantageous to have a de novo uh, ligand for um, inducing signaling through a receptor because it can be more specific, more stable, easier to manufacture, and have fewer pleiotropic side effects because it doesn't interact with um, any other receptors in, in the, the body. And so to, to go after this, we um, our, our starting point in this design process was an existing mini binder that had been developed in the lab that binds monomerically to one uh, subunit of TRIG A. Um, and the, uh, the only downside is that if you try to, um, or if you superimpose two of these TRIC-A mini binders onto the native conformation uh, or the signaling competent conformation of TRIC-A, they actually clash with one another. So we can't use a simple fusion strategy to make a bivalent TRIC-A binder out of these um, existing mini binders. So, uh, for, for this design challenge, we basically said or set the functional motif as these um, binding helices, uh, one from each of the TRIC-A mini binders, and tried to stitch that into one continuous protein. And this is uh, one of the, the proteins that the hallucination method came up with. It's basically an elongated three helix bundle, and um, it's I guess important to note that, or significant to note, that the um, helices are connected in a different topological order than the parent uh, three helix bundle. And of course, um, just the polarity of the helices in the, the parent three helix bundle would have prevented a direct fusion anyway. And then um, to test the functionality of this, we tested the ability to bind purified trick A by biolayer inter interferometry. Um, and so you can see um, 
or I, I guess I should say, you know, it's important that both of these binding sites are able to bind TRIC A. Um, so we can see that the parent has a strong dose dependent um, ability to bind TRIC A. And then if we have this double loss of function mutant, one mutation in each of the binding sites, it significantly abrogates the ability to bind TRIC A. Whereas each of these single site point mutations that leave one of the binding sites fully functional are able to um, partially bind uh, TRIC A, confirming that each one is independently uh, functional. And then the last design problem that I'll talk about is a method to use hallucination to enhance an existing protein-protein interface. Um, and this is uses a slightly different technique than what I've been talking about so far. Um, that uh, so far we've been talking about hallucinations uh, for a single protein chain, but in order to enhance and extend a binding interface, we were really curious if the network could reason about protein-protein interactions. And um, so uh, what we did is we allowed the network to both see the hallucinated chain and the target chain by concatenating the, the two sequences together and then messing a bit with the residue indexing to kind of trick the network into thinking that they're um, two, two separate chains. And then if you look at the... Um, uh, kind of a masking of these pairwise uh, residue uh, interactions, you can see that the on-diagonal squares represent the um, intra-chain contacts and that the, these kind of green off-diagonal um, regions represent the inter-chain contacts. And that's important because we can specifically upweight the, the entropy um, loss function in these interchain contacts to basically encourage the network to be more certain about uh, residue geometry and contacts between the, the two chains. And, uh, and then the region in purple is um, kind of the um, geometry for the small protein stub that we kind of seed the design with um, that we're hoping to um, expand the interface of. So uh, Jude did this for P53, or from a helix from P53, which is an important tumor suppressor gene um, and interacts with its regulatory protein, MDM2. Um, you can see that with the hallucinated protein, it's able to extend the um, binding interface a little bit uh, directly off of the, the helical stub that we started with, as well as a little bit in the back. And then we uh, assess the ability of this protein to uh, bind its binding partner MDM2 by flow cytometry. So you can see the native P53 helix um, has you know, modest affinity for, for MDM2, but that the uh, hallucinated protein is able to bind more strongly, uh, you know, suggesting that we successfully extended the binding interface. So those are the three um, use cases for which we have uh, experimental confirmation. And I just wanted to briefly touch upon some kind of cool experimental future directions um, that we're currently exploring. Um, the first is kind of an extension of what I was just talking about um, of trying to uh, enhance or extend a binding interface starting from a small known stub. Um, you know, there's kind of the logical question or extension of, well, how small a stub can you get away with to begin with? And kind of the logical conclusion of that is wondering if you can just shrink away starting with a stub at all um, and still successfully hallucinate a binding interface. And uh, at least from these preliminary results, it seems that you can. Um, Ju made uh, both of these designs or hallucinated designs in gray are to the trick A protein that I talked about earlier. And you can see that the designs are, you know, proximally situated to the surface and generally have nice shape complementarity to it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, earlier on, I mentioned that these new structure prediction methods not only have accurate um, main chain uh, structure prediction, but they can predict the geometry of side chains very accurately. And of course, that is 
most useful for designing enzymes. Um, so Sydney in our group was interested in doing this and he took on a two-stage approach. In the first stage, you carry out the normal backbone-centered hallucination as I've already described. And then in the second stage of hallucination, you augment the, the loss function with another term that takes into account the um, RMSD of the hallucinated side chain from the reference side chain. And using this approach, um, he was able to uh, tackle two enzyme design problems. The first is carbonic anhydrase. Um, so on the left is the native um, uh, enzyme of carbonic anhydrase. Here you see two different um, backbone solutions and just noting how different they are from the, the native enzyme. And then you can see in this um, zoomed in view that the protein side chains are very close to the um, ground truth side chains. And basically the same can be said of the second design case of ketosteroid isomerase. Uh, the native protein is a, an NTF2-like scaffold and both uh, solutions that hallucination came up with are very different from the, the parent backbone, yet the side chains are placed where they, they should be. So with that, just to summarize the hallucination part of this talk, the, the method starts with a random sequence and iteratively refines it to satisfy a loss function. Um, it can be uh, used with structure prediction networks without any sort of retraining. So as those grow even better and better in the future, they allow more complicated proteins to, or design problems to be tackled with hallucination. And finally, this flexible loss function can be uh, augmented with problem specific terms to, you know, tackle a variety of protein engineering problems. And with that, I'll hand it off to David, who will talk about the second method, um, which is the in-painting method. Okay, excellent. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm David, and I'll just introduce the second method we have for trying to tackle the same sorts of challenges that Doug just introduced. Um, so I wanted to start us off by just uh, contrasting the different functional forms that we might think of when we say uh, protein structure prediction. And so on the left uh, is maybe a functional form that we might think of when, when we would say like vanilla structure prediction or maybe ab initio structure prediction, which is just some function f that takes in only sequence and then outputs only structure. And this contrasts with uh, some of the first deep neural networks that we saw in the field that were able to predict protein structure um, contrasts with their functional form because they actually are a function that takes in not only sequence, but structure as well in the form of homologous templates. Um, and these functions would predict a structure. And um, these neural networks uh, again contrast with the general functional form of uh, the newest structure prediction networks like AlphaFold and RosettaFold. Um, in the sense that in addition to um, taking in sequence and structure, they also output sequence and structure. Um, and sequence is contained in the output because it was ob observed empirically that um, performing the masked language modeling task on MSAs and the input actually encouraged these networks to um, extract more information out of the multiple sequence alignments. Um, and so we were kind of inspired by this new functional form and we thought, well, maybe we could use uh, this cool new functional form to try and tackle similar design challenges, scaffolding of uh, partial chunks of protein into whole folded proteins. And I guess more specifically, what I mean by this is maybe we could get these neural networks to take in any combination of sequence and structure and then in a forward pass, kind of produce a sequence and structure that is uh, joint in the sense that they are coupled to each other and correspond to each other, as well as conditional uh, in the sense that they uh, scaffold well and pay attention to the original uh, sequence and structure that you're hoping to scaffold. And so to try and get, we, we tried to use RosettaFold to do this. And so the way that we generally formulated it was kind of just like the classic information recovery problem that you see in mass language modeling, uh, in which you just have a stack of transformers that learns to model the interactions between different tokens in a series. Um, and it's well known that 
that transformers can uh, perform this type of modeling task with both categorical variables, uh, like you see here with um, sentence modeling, or continuous variables, like you see here in the case of like image modeling. Um, and it's also known that you can do this with protein sequences, the mass language modeling task uh, with just protein sequences. And so uh, what we thought is, well, maybe we can just um, try and perform a similar task, but just attach some protein structure information to each of these tokens as well. And so then when uh, your big stack of transformers makes a prediction about filling in a mass token, it's actually making a joint prediction over sequence and structure simultaneously uh, to fill in the token. And if you could do this well, then uh, these are just some of the tasks that you could try and tackle. You could do structure prediction or sequence design. Those are kind of the boundary cases on having only sequence and no structure or no sequence and only structure. Um, but there's a lot of interesting design problems kind of in between these two boundary conditions where maybe you're trying to do loop design uh, where you have most of your structure and sequence, but just missing your loops, um, or trying to tackle something like Doug was describing earlier, where you're just scaffolding a functional site into a protein. Um, and so we trained Rosetta Fold to do this, and th these are the three tasks that we trained it to do. So the first one is just the joint recovery of sequence and structure, where we uh, penalized the model or applied a loss on its ability to fill in this gray region here of both missing sequence and structure in the output. Um, and we also masked these flanking regions to encourage it to think more about making good packing interactions in Euclidean space rather than depending on the immediate flanking regions in sequence and structure to make its prediction. Um, the second task that we trained is just fixed backbone sequence design essentially, and it's really similar to the first task I just described, but this time you have structure in this in this region, but no sequence. Uh, and then the third task that we trained in parallel is just the classic protein structure prediction problem where you have, in this case, a full MSA. In the other cases, you only have a single sequence. In this case, you have a full MSA and different pieces of it are masked, um, just like the original AlphaFold and RosettaFold training protocol. And then you may have homologous uh, template structure information, and the goal is just to predict the structure of the target sequence. Um, so we trained all of these kind of in parallel and very large batch sizes, and this uh, plot is just to show you that we can train them all in parallel. So the blue curve shows you that during the in-painting task, the network improves its ability to produce structure. Um, the red curve shows you you can learn uh, fixed backbone sequence design, and then the green curve importantly shows you that uh, your ability to predict uh, protein structure in just the classic structure prediction problem actually is maintained throughout this training process. Um, and then so that once we had this pre-trained network, we then tried to use it for these different design problems. And so now I'll just go through some of the design problems. And the first one is scaffolding of this dye iron binding site. And so there exists this protein, the bacteriferritin protein, and it's a pretty like gnarly looking uh, four helix bundle with like a really long loop in it. And, but it contains this really cool motif that can bind two iron atoms. And it would be an interesting uh, piece of protein to try and scaffold because this site is known to catalyze different reactions. And so what we did, uh, or what Joe did in our group is he basically took this, uh, this site, just the bits I've highlighted in orange here for you. And, um, past just those chunks to in-painting. And you can kind of see on the right-hand side here, the different helical bundles that the model came up with. And what's interesting to note is that these uh, different proteins kind of scaffold this motif in different looping orders. And so uh, the iron binding chunks actually appear in different orders in primary sequence. Um, and you can also kind of just see the difference in lengths of proteins that the model is able to produce. Um, and so to assay these proteins for function, um, since iron doesn't have an easy spectroscopic readout, we used uh, cobalt as kind of a proxy for the ability to bind iron. Um, and uh, there's a few papers before us that, that show that you can actually measure cobalt binding in iron binding sites. Um, 
because they have the same coordination geometry. And then you just look for these, these characteristic absorption peaks at uh, 510, 550, and 590 nanometers. And so when we expressed and purified these designs in EOI, we got to see actually that when we add cobalt, we get these nice cobalt binding absorbent spectra, which was really cool. And then importantly, when you knock out the key cobalt or iron binding residues, uh, that signal goes away um, with or without the presence of cobalt, indicating that we're binding it with the correct residues. Um, we also just verified with uh, CD that these designs look helical. And uh, we also interestingly found out that when you add cobalt uh, in with these proteins, they melt at much higher temperatures. And that's just seen depicted by these melt curves on the bottom row here. Um, okay, yeah. And then another design problem that we tried to tackle is scaffolding the PD1 uh, binding interface against PDL1. And so um, being able to control the interaction between PD1 and PDL1 uh, is an interesting problem because if you can control it, you can uh, use it for targeted cancer cell therapy. And um, so what we did here is we basically just took this high affinity consensus version of PD-1 against PDL one and removed any non-interfacial residues and basically just fed the network what I'm showing you in the center here in orange, which is this like discontiguous uh, beta sheet against PDL one. And um, we modeled both of these like in complex together. So the network both process the target and this interface while in painting and connecting these different pieces. And over on the right here, you can just see one of the uh, design models of the experimental hits that we found. Um, and in, yeah, in the next slide, just um, qualitatively looking at the structure of this design, it's quite distinct from the native. Um, and there's like a relooping of the different interfacial strands, which just kind of goes to show um, how easy you can rewire the different functional components of a motif uh, into some whole protein uh, with this method. And uh, it's just kind of cool also that we turned this uh, beta sandwich fold into um, an alpha beta fold with a couple buttressing helices. So just totally changed the topology. Um, but yeah, when we put this design in yeast, um, we can see that there is binding signal. Uh, this is from the original pool of 31 designs that we ordered. We saw binding signal and then uh, more binding signal uh, by uh, flow cytometry in an enriched population. And then we also verified that uh, it competes with the native PD-1 uh, for binding to PDL one which was really exciting. And then we also just found out that when expressed and purified in E. coli, that this design is monomeric uh, by size exclusion chromatography. And then uh, we also have just binding data by octet um, showing that in solution, this protein can also bind PDL1. So it looks like this is uh, a functional protein as well. Um, and then the last design problem I wanted to describe to you guys is uh, just scaffolding the EF hand calcium binding domain. Um, and this is an interesting domain to try and scaffold. Um, I guess what I have here mostly just because of an EF hand's ability to bind lanthanides as well um, for use as contrast agents or maybe for use in photonic circuits. Um, but basically what we did here is we took this bit in orange from a native EF hand and I guess also on the right, the bit in purple, as well as four residues on either side of each of these EF hands and nothing else. And so we fed the, the green and the purple bits to the model, and then it produced the bits, the sequence and structure in gray. Um, and this is a depiction of one of the hits that we found uh, by experiment. To assay for function for this, you just, um, instead of calcium, because it doesn't have a spectroscopic readout, we use terbium uh, fluorescence. And so you, again, can just look at uh, these different uh, characteristic emission peaks for terbium fluorescence. And so when we expressed and purified this design in E. coli, we did get to see this really cool terbium emission spectrum too, um, indicating that it can bind terbium and likely then calcium as well. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so in the last little bit here, we just have a few slides 
trying to describe to you uh, the differences and strengths and weaknesses of each approach. And so in this first uh, set of slides, the first benchmark, uh, one thing we looked at is just how accurately these two different methods, hallucination and inpainting, could scaffold a motif. And so what we did here is we took 36 de novo proteins uh, published after the Rosetta Fold training set procurement. And then we just, for a bunch of different window sizes uh, and for 20 segments per window size, just randomly masked a segment for each de novo protein. And then using either method uh, filled in the gap or filled in the mask region and looked at the resulting alpha folds, of those sequences. Um, and we specifically looked at the alpha fold PLDDT of, of the inpainted region as well as the motif RMSD um, in the unmasked region. And so this kind of top plot on the y-axis is inpainting PLDDT versus hallucination PLDDT. And you can see generally for modest sized masked windows, inpainting is able to produce sequences that maybe AlphaFold prefers just a little bit. Um, and then the correlation kind of gets a bit fuzzier as you go to really large uh, masked sizes. And then down here, kind of a similar story you can see is just in the motif RMSD or the RMSD between the original unmasked protein and the alpha fold prediction of that region. Um, you can see that often for these modest, these lower to medium sized masked windows in painting can produce maybe a little bit better uh, RMSDs by alpha fold than hallucination. And again, it's, it kind of evens out as we go to larger window sizes. And then um, the second benchmark that we did is just uh, a quick check, oops, just checking out like the diversity of the structures produced by either method. And so here um, on the left, what you're seeing is just cluster representatives from a whole bunch of constrained hallucination designs for the RSV task that Doug described earlier. Um, and just visually looking at all of these clusters, you can see that hallucination, constrained hallucination can uh, sample a really wide variety of backbones. Um, whereas the, if you kind of look at the same clustering for inpainting, there's not nearly as many uh, different diverse scaffolds sampled. And you can see like there's a range of mostly alpha to mostly beta proteins and all sorts of things in between. And then when you just randomly sample um, a whole bunch of designs that have already been filtered, uh, filtering meaning a high PLDDT and a low RMSD, you can just see that the distributions of kind of either inpainting uh, the TM score, the pairwise TM score internally for inpainting or internally for hallucination, um, the distribution is much lower for hallucination. So it can come up with far greater diversity structurally than in painting. Um, and we kind of generally see this for a variety of, of design challenges. Um, so that's a real strength of hallucination. Um, and then I guess the final note too is that one strength of, of in painting is that it's, it's faster. It requires maybe one to 10 uh, forward passes through a structure prediction network. Um, whereas hallucination requires like maybe hundreds to thousands of passes. And then the downside of in painting is that you actually have to take one of these networks and retrain it, um, which takes a while. Whereas you can just uh, use a structure prediction network right out of the box um, with the hallucination method. And I think with that, that's our last slide. And we just need to acknowledge all of these people that have helped us do all of this work. Uh, and it definitely wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. We have some, uh, as you know, we've had some AV issues um, regarding some Zoom bombings earlier. And I just want to applaud the speakers for doing such a good job of navigating that. Um, so what we're going to do is, at least what we're going to try to do, is open up things for questions by um, 
using the chat rather than um, the video or audio as hopefully that'll be a way to um, minimize some of the problems we had earlier. Um, so I encourage people to do is just post questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I can ask an initial question and then hopefully others will take it away. Um, so my first question is, as you mentioned, you're, you're, you're piggybacking off of some large model that took a lot of resources to pre-train, right? And like, there's this idea, for example, that there's two heads from this model. There's like the structure prediction head and the sort of sequence reconstruction head. What is like your, the grand model? Like if you have, if there were no uh, restrictions in terms of sort of software engineering or compute resources, what do you think would be like the ideal large scale pre-training setup for this? Um, like, it, what would be kind of like the dream network that could produce uh, designs or maybe design uh, like in painting does, but be easier to use or easier to pre-train? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean, like, obviously the dream network would just like give you the answer right away. But like, the, what I mean is like, what is sort of like a doable sort of, how can we take the protein universe and train something on it in such a way that you could then sort of use that to the ends that you're, you're hoping to use? Right? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, just thinking back on like some of the things that are still tricky to navigate sometimes with the current network, like um, you say, if you have, if you're trying to scaffold like a discontiguous chunk or two chunks of protein, you actually have to, the way that this is set up in the architecture of Rosetta Fold is that you have to specify, you actually have to choose as a user which, um, looping order to put those two chunks into a protein with. And so um, I like one really cool thing would be a network or an architecture that could kind of learn that for you, learn the looping order, as well as learn how, like the distribution of how many residues to connect these chunks with, which is a really hard problem. And the way that we get around that now is just kind of by sampling quite a bit. Um, but a network that could model maybe those distributions would be really cool. Cool, thanks. Um, so we have some, oh wait, sorry, I can't. There's some questions in the chat. Actually, can you just see the chat? It might be. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, for example, have you found motifs where you did not find a backbone that could scaffold the motifs? Yeah, I guess, I mean, it maybe partially depends by what you mean by not scaffolding. Uh, certainly there are ones we haven't had like experimental uh, success yet in um, getting binders for by what lab you can confirm. Um, I think for a while I worked on C3D, which is a, a protein in the complement cascade. Um, and uh, that kind of had a pretty small binding interface to like one arginine that was sticking out on the target and it had a, a loop um, that had to be stabilized by kind of a native hydrogen bond network. So that was definitely something I tried for a while and uh, wasn't able to get anything to bind. Um, but definitely that was before AlphaFold came out and the, the filtering step that we use with AlphaFold has been a big help in kind of picking out uh, what designs uh, to move forward and try to experimentally characterize. Cool. Is there any particular, okay, so Chun Chen asks, is there any particular problem when the binding target being, with the binding target being very loop rich? Um, I don't know if, at least in our experience, we've attempted any really like loop rich interfaces, but that is certainly like a really difficult problem. Um, and it would be really cool if we, if like these techniques um, could model loop rich interfaces like antibodies. Um, but we haven't, I don't think, really extensively tested it on those. Yeah. We, for the motifs we picked, we definitely favored motifs that had more secondary structure. Mm -hmm. um, in it, but loops would be the, uh, the next more challenging thing to go after. And then Ayasia asks, why are multiple forward passes needed for inpainting? Are those iterative forward passes one after another? And how do the inputs then change? Yeah, so um, it's kind of for two reasons. 
So one Rosetta fold and alpha fold during training, um, both teams found out that it's actually advantageous to do uh, recycling in the structure prediction process. And so during both during training and inference um, to refine a structure prediction, you can make one pass and then take the state uh, at the output and then recycle that information back through over and over again. So that's one reason. The other reason too is that um, mostly for the quality of the sequences that in painting produces. So with each forward pass, um, Rosetta Fold, uh, when it's in painting a region, will produce a set of logits in the mask region. And then you have to sample from those logits to get a sequence. And the way that we do it, it's pretty naive. We just arg max those logits to get the, get the hard sequence and then feed it back in. But we found that if you do this kind of cycling over and over again, then you can kind of slowly, iteratively refine the quality of the sequence and the quality, this, the sequence gets much better as you do more recycles. Let's see, you showed some nice biochemical data demonstrating increased uh, protein interaction affinities for some of your designs. What percentage of hallucinated or in-painted structural candidates give you the functional response you're looking for? Do you just use the candidates with the best uh, uh, score screen for, uh, for which to test, or do you have other heuristics as well? Um, let's see, so what, what percentage of the designs give us functionally the response we're looking for? You know, honestly, that, that can vary quite a bit um, depending on how easy or tough the design task is. I know for like the trick A binders, um, I think of the, the ones I screened, probably half showed some sort of binding. I think that's just because it has a really strong like hydrophobic um, helix. That's the binding interface, but things that are more polar would uh, have uh, less success rate. And let's see, do we just use the candidates with the best score or do we have other heuristics? Um, I think by and large, the, the scoring particularly helps with the like protein protein interaction cases. Um, I think initially before AlphaFold, we did have some uh, heuristics like the, the compactness of the, the, the protein or maybe the radius of gyration. Sometimes you'd have like long spaghetti structures that didn't make any sense, but I think with the metrics now, the PLDDT is uh, only high when, when you have reasonable looking structures. That, that really helps cut down on the heuristics. There's also things beyond alpha fold that we filtered for, um, like just net charge or a reduced SAP score. Um, the surface aggregation propensity. Yeah, reduced surface aggregation propensity score. Um, I guess just to try to give designs also the best shot at being soluble um, and expressing well. So those were a couple filters too. Uh, curious if hallucination might be useful in modeling conformations of intrinsically disordered or dynamic regions of proteins. Just wondering if it'd be worth trying to model possible conformations of a region that might not be easily characterized in a crystal structure. Just quickly before you respond, um, the call is ending at five formally, but like you should totally just stay on and answer like if people want to hang around. Um, so yeah, you don't need to answer this in zero seconds. Go for it and we can just keep things going. Okay, great. Um, I don't think we've tried with intrinsically disordered proteins or things that we have uh, no crystal structures on, but kind of an in interesting observation we made with the like two chain uh, at least the hallucination method, is that sometimes you could get an increase in uh, binding surface area because the, the target, although we provide a template and tell the network it's a very good template to use, uh, the network will predict a slightly different conformation. And so sometimes like it can move a loop or a flexible region of the target out of the way or kind of mold it over the hallucinated protein to try to make uh, better uh, uh, area of contact. Um, so although, yeah, we haven't tried intrinsically disordered 
of proteins, it uh, looks like the network can reason slightly about uh, regions with conformational flexibility. Okay. Uh, let's see, for two chain hallucination, did you notice a favorite type of interaction between the uh, chains, i.e. polar versus nonpolar? Also, could this be used to increase the shape complementarity of the interface you're trying to design? Uh, yeah, so let's see, a type of favorite interaction. Yeah, I'd say it definitely likes uh, hydrophobic, uh, so nonpolar interactions. Um, yeah, it, it still isn't great at being able to like design a complex hydrogen bond network, say, to um, make a, a more polar interface. So that's definitely an area where it could improve. Um, and does this increase the shape complementarity? Um, I would say yes, for the reasons I, I just described. Sometimes there's slight conformational flexibility on the, the end of the, or on the target that we're trying to find. Let's see, for the who, Iossi is asking, for the hallucinated binders, what was that done with Rosetta Fold? Did anybody try binder design with AlphaFold uh, Multimer V2? Uh, for the hallucinated designs, those are all done with the Rosetta Fold network. Um, and so we have not tried um, binder design with AlphaFold uh, Multimer yet. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for all the great questions and uh, thanks for the invitation to give the talk. It was really uh, a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll see everyone in two weeks for the next talk. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, everyone.